Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Camille Wilson and I work with the Office of Enrollment Management here at NYU. And I'm so excited to welcome you all to our Trailblazer session today called Recovering Hidden Knowledge, Untold Stories of the Black Experience with Professor Jacqueline Bishop. Our hope today is that you'll get a glimpse into our vibrant academic community and see for yourself why this place has become home for so many. We really hope that you'll leave this session inspired by our talented faculty and excited by the possibility of joining this rich, diverse community of thinkers, scholars, change makers, and go-getters. But before we go any further, we just wanted to share a few housekeeping tips with you. So as attendees, you all will be muted for the duration of our webinar. And while we can't see you, we can absolutely feel your energy out there. During this session, we won't cover any admissions or financial aid information, but if you do have questions about that or about the application process, we just invite you to visit our website, give us a call or send us an email. Our staff is ready and available to help you with any questions or concerns that you might have. And if you are interested in asking questions about this session in particular, you please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We are going to have time for live Q&A at the end of the session. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Professor Bishop. Professor Bishop is Clinical Associate Professor of Liberal Studies and an award-winning writer and visual artist born and raised in Jamaica, who now lives between Miami and New York City. She has twice been awarded Fulbright Fellowships, including a year-long grant to Morocco. Her work exhibits widely in North America, Europe, and North Africa. Professor Bishop's books include a novel, The River Song, two collections of poems, Fauna and Snapshots from Istanbul, an art book entitled Writers Who Paint, Painters Who Write, Three Jamaican Artists, and The Gymnast and Other Positions, a collection of short stories, essays, and interviews. The Gymnast and Other Positions won the nonfiction category of the 2016 OCM Vocus Prize for Caribbean Literature, and The Gift of Music and Song, Interviews with Jamaican Women Writers is her most recent publication. In this webinar, Professor Bishop will discuss recovering hidden knowledge, untold stories of the Black experience. As dialogues around race and racial justice take center stage, critical questions arise and or are being re-articulated or refined. For example, how does one talk back to dominant narratives? How do we counter absence and erasure? How do research and other counter insufficiencies of current archives fill in the gaps of historical knowledge? This session will explore methods, insights, and ways of recovering hidden knowledge and untold stories within, among, and about the Black experience, oral histories, interviews, and material culture. The session will talk through why traditional methods are insufficient in providing a more full and complete story of the Black experience, while simultaneously centering methodologies which broaden and add to the narratives and archives of the Black experience. With that, Professor Bishop, if you could please unmute and take it away. Thank you so much, Camille, for this wonderful, wonderful introduction. Um, it's just an honor to be here um, and to be asked to talk um, a little bit with um, the students and, um, and whoever else might be listening. It was particularly moving to have that introduction by Houdini, the rapper, um, who unfortunately we, we lost last year, but um, his insistence on self, you know, and doing for self and what it means to, um, to go out into the world as a young person, I thought would resonate with the young folks that um, I'll be talking to today. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, I'm not actually seeing my face on the, the thing, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm showing up, but I hope that you'll be able to see me um, as I talk. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about today is um, a, a series of dinner plates that um, I did. Um, you can see the, the plates up on the screen. Um, and this series is called History at the Dinner Table. I was born and spent my childhood on the island of Jamaica, 
And on the island, um, I moved between various houses, my mother's house, my grandmother's house, my great grandmother's house. I was fortunate um, to have a great grandmother um, and grew up with a great grandmother and a great grandfather in a tiny little district called Nonsuch. That's where they lived. Um, and one of the ways that you show your womanhood in Jamaica is you have your dinner plates and your, um, your mahogany cabinets. And so I was always fascinated by the dinner plates that my grandmother in particular had since I spent my childhood with her. And um, she just cherished her dinner plates. She cherished her mahogany cabinets. And um, I lived with her in Kingston before she moved back to Nonsuch in that small district of, um, in, that, in that parish of Portland. And she just cherished these plates. And I remember looking at these plates and, you know, they had everything from monarchy. They had everything from uh, women in crinoline dresses and whatnot. And as I came of age and became an artist, I decided to pull apart these stories that were on these plates to uh, tell hidden narratives that may lie beneath the, the stories that were on my grandmother's plates. And that's what you're looking at um, in these plates. History at the dinner table is the stories of enslavement, the stories of sugar and um, displacement, colonialism, imperialism that gave rise to the imagery that was on my grandmother's dinner plates. Um, for example, the image um, of the figure in blue is based on a woman being beaten in Suriname. And I wanted to give these women back their femininity, um, despite the horrible circumstances that they found themselves in. Wrapped around this imagery is imagery of um, uh, abolition as well. For example, we see that in the kneeling uh, figure, uh, which is a known abolitionist um, figure. And quite poignantly, I've been told, is the figure of the woman who has this thing covering her mouth, uh, very indicative of the stories that she could not tell. And one of the things that I wanted to do with this plate is to, sh with these plates, is to show some of the ways in which we get at stories, untold stories, that you might not, for example, find in archives. You can locate these stories, for example, in images. And we, um, uh, of this time and of this place, I feel have a responsibility in bringing forward and telling these untold stories. Um, I'm gonna move on now um, to uh, some books, right? Um, and so uh, telling untold stories is part of what I do uh, in my life as a scholar and as a writer and as a thinker and as a woman and a woman of color and a person. But it's also very much uh, integrated into how I teach my classes. Um, so perhaps the first book or certainly one of the first books that I had published, I think I'm up to seven next year, I should get to eight or something like this, is My Mother Who Is Me which is um, uh, the book with the green all over it. And these are life stories of Jamaican women. Um, and in My Mother Who Is Me, uh, how this book came about, both books actually came from looking around and trying to uh, find myself and my place. I was probably your age. I, I'm assuming that there are a lot of younger people than myself on this um, webinar and trying to place myself and my story in a larger, in, in the case of my mother who is me, American story. Um, so my story uh, in brief goes like this, born and grew up on the island of Jamaica. My mother migrated to the United States and I came to join her and I started, go, and my college education is in the United States. I also have siblings and nieces and nephews who are um, American born. And so I was in a class and we had to, um, you know, write papers and all the things that you do as um, undergraduate and graduate students. And um, 
I, I was trying to think through, well, what will my paper be? And I, I had to meet with a professor and I was thinking, oh, I'll do a paper. It was a literature class on women on madness and all of these kind of things. And the professor leaned back in the ways that I find myself doing these days with my very own darling students who I love so much. And um, the professor said, Jacqueline, tell me about yourself. And so I started telling her my story of immigration, my mother's story, um, my sister Kamara's story of being first generation um, American. And um, she said, what about those stories? Go and tell those stories. And the process of that became my mother who is me, life stories from Jamaican women in New York. And in the end, I followed this project for so many years that I ended up uh, learning how to do oral history which, um, at Columbia University, which I, I think is a central methodology that I use to get at these untold and hidden stories. When these stories are not in archives, you have to take them from individuals in the form of oral histories. You have to get them that way. And that's what I did in My Mother Who Is Me. Um, but in thinking through My Mother Who Is Me, I started to think even further about even within that story of Jamaican women migrants who might be silenced further and invisible within that story. And so I have stories within the book. The first section of the book are Afro-Jamaican women. And the second section of the book are Chinese Jamaican women Indian Jamaican women, Jewish Jamaican women, white Jamaican women, and the stories they had to tell in addition to women of different sexualities, right? And I remember one of the reviewers um, saying at the time, I, I don't even know how to begin to review this book because um, they would never quite seen anything like it. The second book, The Gift of Music and Song, um, are interviews with Jamaican women writers. So I, you're beginning to see, I hope, that the technique of interviewing and oral history and material culture is very much part of how I get it and tell untold story. And by the way, I utilize these techniques in my classroom. One of the, my courses is dedicated ex exclusively to interviewing and oral history. Um, I just want to point out that on the cover of The Gift of Music and Song is a wonderful, wonderful applique embroidered work um, by an unknown Jamaican woman. Um, the person who did the drawing for this work is uh, also um, an understudied Jamaican artist, uh, Rhoda Jackson, but the person who actually did the work, we don't know, and I doubt we will ever know who this woman is. And I felt that it was important to take this image and give it the visibility that it deserves um, by putting it on the cover of this book. This book came about in talking to um, Sharon Leach, who is the editor of the um, bookend section of the Jamaica Observer, about the lack of interviews with um, Caribbean writers in general, but um, women writers and specifically Jamaican women writers. And I started interviewing um, these women and Sharon started publishing them in the bookend section of the Jamaica Observer. And there was just so much interest in what we were doing that at first we were doing Jamaican women writers. And then it became one uh, Women's History Month was focused on Jamaican women writers. And then another month was focused on Caribbean writers, women and men. Uh, just to kind of hear their thoughts and to give visibility to them. And so um, I'm not sure if I've, what my time frame is like. Um, perhaps uh, Camille or someone can tell me where I am in regards to time. Um, but those are some of the ways in which I uh, I, I utilize um, some of the methodologies that I utilize to get at untold stories. Um, one big untold story that um, I, I'm going to be um, 
uh, yeah, that, good, uh, that I'm, I'm going to be working with this summer, the first semester of the summer section is I'm going to be teaching along with Dr. Kaia Shivers of um, Liberal Studies. We put together a proposal to the Big Ideas course series at NYU to teach a course called Welcome to the, the Party, Dance Hall, Trap and Bounce Music. And we are going to do a deep dive looking at the various um, issues um, that are implicated in dance hall music, in hip hop music, in bounce music. Um, whether it is how these, these men and women are blinging themselves out or what it is that they have to say about the realities that they are living through and living in as young urban people. So I hope you will come together and join that course. And I hope you will begin to see the various ways in which um, material culture, um, oral history and interviews can intervene and give us a more vibrant, rich, lived story um, than the one that is often presented to us. Thank you so much. I look forward to a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Bishop. That was incredible. We so appreciate you sharing with us and just giving us an amazing taste of NYU's academics. So we are gonna transition and take some questions from our audience. So if you are out there and you have a question for Professor Bishop, please feel free to drop it in our Q&A box. Um, hopefully we'll have a chance to get to all of your questions today. Um, so to kick us off, I do have a question for you. And you talked a little bit about this uh, when you were talking about your experience in college, um, but can you just tell us a little bit about where your love for storytelling originated? Like, where did it start? And why is telling untold stories so important to you? Thank you so much. And um, Camille, that's a tough one. I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question before. And I've been interviewed and interviewed and interviewed. Um, but as you were talking, I remember that, um, again, I was very lucky in that in growing up on the island of Jamaica, every summer holiday, I was sent to this, this tiny district called Nonsuch, um, where my grand grandmother was from and where my great grandparents lived and where I had numerous cousins and you know various things going on. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with my great grandparents. Um, and it was interesting because their appearance, physical appearance was so different. Um, so my great grandfather was uh, slender and very light skinned with wavy hair and bluish colored eyes. And my um, great grandmother was very uh, small woman, um, very dark skinned, um, and she did a lot of patchworks. And she arranged her gardens in specific ways, and even the fish and the that she sold, she arranged in very specific ways. Um, so as I mature more as an um, artist. I see that I am pulling a lot of my storytelling from my great grandmother and from my grandmother and from my mother. Um, I use patchwork um, as uh, uh, an intrinsic, intrinsic component of what I do. My great grandmother was also a fantastic collagist. She would collage, this, is, this woman was born in early 1900s Jamaica and did not have um, all the opportunities that I have. Yet um, from oral history interviews, she was collaging her home with newsprint and magazine articles. And so now I realize where I get my collaging from, I get it from my great grandmother. So, so much of what I'm doing, the, the history at the dinner table series is based on my grandmother's dishes that are still in her home in Nonsuch that she treasured so much. Um, I wanna say one other thing about my great grandfather. 
um, because he, I kind of feel like he gets shifted a little in my, in, in the narrative of my story, but he's incredibly important. Um, my, my great grandfather did not look like most people looked in Nonsuch. It was clear that he had a European background. And, um, <clears throat> and the more we research, the more his European heritage becomes clear. Um, his family was from Ireland. Um, uh, and or Scotland, one of those, and his father's father came over as a cook on a, a, a boat, and um, he came from the other side of the island. My great grandfather would take me by the hand, he was a farmer by profession and a laborer, and he would walk with me through the bushes, um, and he would tell me stories. Um, Jamaican folk tales, and he would tell, and he firmly believed, as did my great grandmother, um, that there was a life after this physical body. And he would tell me about enslaved people and the respect that needed to be shown to them. And he would just, um, instead, you know, he was not one to, for, for me as his great grandchild, to hammer. Um, uh, life lessons into, but his ways of, of getting me to understand things was through stories. And so I think that's largely where I get the love of storytelling from, was from my great grandparents, you know, materially and actually what they said. No, I've forgotten the second part of your question. <laughs> What's the second part of your question? I think you actually, you captured it so well with your response. Uh, it, it's so interesting you say that because, you know, we were relating your love of patchwork and collaging to your great grandmother. And I feel like that's something as you get older, you start to see your parents influence or grandparents or great grandparents influence on you. And it's something I'm noticing myself and it just makes me giggle every time. So it's, it's I just love that you're also having that same, those same kind of epiphanies with yeah. you. It's, it's just wonderful. My mother was a great, um, my mother is still with us, thank God. Um, she is a, she's a great um, crochet maker. And my, the women in my family, my grandmother and her sisters continued in the tradition of making patchworks that my, gra my great grandmother made. So, um, and it's the subject of my dissertation now. So there you go. That is so incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question I have for you is, can you tell us briefly about a story that impacted you for the better? Because I know you, you know, for years and years, you have been going around interviewing people, collecting these amazing narratives. Is there one story that you can identify that has really impacted you for the better? Um, I think that um, as instructors and teachers, uh, we spend so much time intro um, uh, introducing new methodologies and ideas to students that it might seem as though um, teaching and learning is a one-way street. But in fact, I oftentimes say I learn as much from my students as my students learn from me. Um, and I say that because in the oral history class that I teach, um, students do not have to focus on African and African diasporic stories. Mm -hmm. Students are able to focus on whatever stories they choose, as long as it's an untold or undertold story. And um, in so doing, um, students have told stories in this um, oral history class that have made me pause and have impacted on me in all sorts of ways. Um, so for example, um, I remember uh, two um, oral history projects in particular that I will carry with me always. And one was uh, the students went out and did an oral history project on female firefighters and all the issues that these female firefighters had to face. And I'd never thought of it before. Um, from my students, I got to understand why so many taxi drivers are male, mm -hmm. right? And it has to do with bathroom access, something as simple as that, <laughs> right? 
Um, uh, other stories that my students, I had a group that um, was very focused on medicine and they looked at women surgeon and whether the, the actual implements that women had to use could fit their hands and how women had to negotiate around being surgeons. Um, so there are wonderful, wonderful. In fact, my oral history class is one of my favorite classes to teach because I know the students are going to, I'm going to learn something from them that I do not know before. Oh my goodness. I love, I just got like goosebumps <laughs> listening to you describe. I think those are such important stories to tell and they reveal things that we would never even think of. So I, I love that you shared those two. Um, and speaking of your students, uh, another question from one of our attendees kind of ties in really well to that. Um, are there stories today that are super important to tell and how should students go about collecting those, those oral histories? Like how do you teach students to go about doing that? Well, um, uh, last year as the pandemic took hold, I was teaching, uh, I taught for one, my, my year of teaching online, I was teaching um, students in Shanghai, right? Wonderful experience, wonderful experience in that um, I was learning so much about China and they were learning so much about the Chinese experience in Jamaica and the larger Caribbean. Right, and the students were like, "Oh my goodness, they they didn't know that they the the Chinese that ended up in places like the Caribbean and you know um, and whatnot, right? The um, the Chinese uh, had spread out all over, um, and so um, in the course, I the the course is focused around teaching them." throughout the semester, all these various oral history techniques and whatnot. Uh, uh, at the end of the course, one student said to me, I am now a trained oral historian. Mm -hmm. That made, that was more meaningful to me than the student might have realized, mm -hmm. right? It almost brought me to tears, right? And the student did not know it, right? Um, because what he, the confidence that he now had him in himself was a young man um, to go ahead and tell, find and tell these untold stories. He now had the tools to, with which to do this. And I felt, okay, right? This is what I was hoping to um, impart this semester. So if students want to tell stories and untold stories, first they have to kind of sharpen the lens of their eyes, which is what I do oftentimes in the class. We spend a lot of time talking through stories and how they might approach stories. And then they have to develop the methodologies with which to do so. And the methodologies come in multiple forms. Oral history is just one. I happen to love oral history. I happen to love interviewing um, because it really, um, so for example, I'm working on a new body of work now involving artists' voices and artists' works, um, particularly when it comes to vernacular culture and needlework culture. And these voices are impacting various hierarchies and talking back to power, right? And giving meaning to the work that they create as opposed to what uh, myself who's been trained as an art historian or cultural studies person um, and said, those are not the only meanings. And so I, I really love that the artists, um, uh, the women who particularly who oftentimes are just overlooked in interpretations of their work can talk back. This reminds me of a project that I did. Um, um, it's a material studies project. Um, I was, of course, uh, a Fulbright Fellow to, Mo to Morocco. And if you ever get to Morocco, at least when I did, what stood out for me apart from the food was um, the needlework the needlework culture. I mean, every section in Morocco has a distinct embroidery. And so I started using this distinct embroidery in my own um, 
uh, in my own work. And I, I, I started making patchworks and the women around kept saying, well, can you teach us how to make patchworks and we'll teach you how to embroider and so, you know, an exchange of skills. Well, this caught the eye of the American embassy and to make a long story short, uh, we got a grant um, to put African-American women, um, patchwork makers in conversation with um, Moroccan um, embroidery makers. Mm -hmm. And the African-American women went to Morocco and the Moroccan women came to the US and we had exhibitions of their work. And I, 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 I stood aside sometimes as the Moroccan, and these women did not speak the same language outside of the material things that they were making. Mm -hmm. And I remember the Moroccan women touching the things on um, the walls as they were exhibited as though they could not quite believe what was happening. And similar things were happening for the African-American women. And at the end, it was a year long project. There was a lot of tears and people could not speak the language, but they could communicate, right? And women, the women, we made many films around them, started to talk about the meanings that were implicated in their work. Mm -hmm. Untold story. <laughs> I, love that. I think storytelling, whether it's oral, whether it's you know material, it just evokes such powerful emotions, which I I absolutely love. And it's like you know, there's no language barrier there, right? Um, it just you know goes to show the impact of your work. Even you talking about the student that felt so confident in his, um, you know, ability to collect those oral stories. I think is you know really testament to the the work and the passion that you have. So I certainly appreciate that. Um, and then another question. You know, he came to find me at the beginning of the semester. He had found he was he had finally come to New York, and I was teaching my class, and I looked up, and he said, "I found you again, Professor." <laughs> I love that. That is, that is really, really inspiring. Um, so we have a question here from Rankin in our audience, um, who thanks you for your wonderful session and says that they're interested in film and wondering if you have any favorite films that demonstrate your interest in oral history and untold stories. I love that question. Yes, well, um, there, are one, there are all sorts of films that I am interested in, but what, what would be more interesting for me is whatever film he is or she is interested in, right? Um, because I think that a session like this is to, to, give, to, to help these students and whoever is listening to give voice to what they are doing, right? Um, to help them to find their voice and their vision um, this is what I, I oftentimes, a lot of my, sem my semester, I, I say to students, listen, uh, there is no exams and there are no tests and there's none of this going on in my class, uh, but there's a lot of workshop, you know? There's a lot of workshop going on in this class um, uh, um, because the whole point of this is for them to find their voice and their vision and this is what the world hungers for, is whoever asked this question, it's your voice and your vision and the stories that you are going to tell. My class is to get you thinking and to give you the techniques to do that, right? Um, so instead of me saying this story or this whatnot, I'd rather, I, I'm much more interested in the stories that the students themselves tell me about or the, student, or the stories they want to tell and the ways in which I can help them to get to telling the stories they want to tell. Yeah. I love that. And a, a class that has no tests is really the class for me. So that sounds great. I love, I love workshopping. <laughs> Um, so just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, how do you believe that untold stories can alter or influence stories of the present or potentially the future? Untold stories are very, very important. Um, they give us a richer, clearer, more dynamic sense of the past and um, of the present and possibly where we might be headed, right? Um, there's a lot of resistance 
to examining here in the United States, the past and its implications to our present and possibly our future. Um, I'm not sure the nature of that resistance because it only lets us understand things uh, so much more better, right? Um, and it gets us to uh, uh, more understanding, right? Um, so I think in uh, uh, examining and re-examining the past, we get a clearer lives that were lit, clearer um, example of lives as they were lived, which is a continuing process, right? And how that impacts on how our lives and how we even uh, engage and think about the future, right? So I think it is very important to re-examine the, the past uh, as we reimagine the future, right? I, I really think so. I really think it's important. Yeah, that was so well said. Thank you so much. Um, and then we just have one final question. You talked a little bit about um, this new course that's coming in the summer, Welcome to the Party. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the curriculum for that looks like? And maybe if you have any other examples of classes that students might be able to take in the liberal studies department. Well, let's take the second question first. Um, uh, liberal studies is wonderful. It is um, absolutely wonderful. Um, students love liberal studies in general because it, um, it, it recreates or it creates um, a community atmosphere, a small college atmosphere within a bigger college atmosphere. And that's what students love about liberal studies. Prior to the pandemic, students would hang out in, our, in, in liberal studies all the time. And that's what they talked about over and over again, was this sense of collegiality, of community, of a, a sense of a small college within a larger college. Um, one thing that I've noticed about liberal studies faculty over and over again, is that you rarely ever see doors closed, right? Unless uh, students are a faculty member is not in their office or they are having a private meeting, their doors are open, right? Um, and finally, there's just a wide breadth of courses to take at liberal studies. Just, you imagine it, you can take it. And um, that, that's, that's the strength of liberal studies is that so many people have so many different um, areas of expertise that you can draw upon in this program. So I, I give much love to um, liberal studies. Now, what was your first part of your question again? I just want to hear about this dance hall trap music. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I know the audience wants to as well. Yes. So I hope they all come to take this course. It will be in the first session of the summer session from May to July. And uh, Dr. Kaya Shivers and I got to talking about this and we got to looking around to see if there was a course and there wasn't. And so what we're going to be looking at is um, uh, the roots of these um, genres of music. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to be pulling at various themes um, and examining them, right? So we're going to be looking at, for example, um, women um, um, and how they represent the black female body um, in this in the music. We're we're thinking now of Cardi B and WAP, and you know, and we're thinking of um, Nicki Minaj and Anaconda, but also uh, Spice and some of the, the Jamaican dancehall artists, they really revel in and celebrate the Black female body. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we're also going to look at some of the negative associations that have been um, thrown at um, um, this, this genre of music and really um, there, I, I, I mean, and really examining 
whether this is fair or not, right? I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this generating, um, leading to all sorts of bad outcomes. And we, we have to really ask, where's the evidence for this, mm -hmm. right? And why is it um, that young, mainly black <clears throat> entertainers um, are so targeted, it seems, when they speak about the realities of their lives. Uh, we are going to pay particular attention to a young Canadian rapper who unfortunately died, um, Houdini, who was just making fantastic music out of uh, Canada to see what he was doing that separated him so much from um, what was going on in Canada. His was the introduction myself that we listened to. We're going to have a whole session on Houdini. We're going to also look at case studies of how um, these hip hop artists are marketing themselves and the goods that they're marketing and whatnot. There's, um, there is one session called Spotify Numbers Do Not Lie, right? In which we talk about, uh, well, who is it that's consuming this music, right? Because the consumption numbers are so high that this is outside and beyond just black people consuming this music, right? Um, and so we, we plan to really have a great time, right? So I hope everyone will come in and join us as we have space for this course. It's an online course um, open to all NYU sites, um, uh, global sites. Um, so I guess it's a first come first serve basis. Wonderful. I, I hope it's open to staff as well because I will be the first to sign up. <laughs> But thank you so much, Professor Bishop, um, for this wonderful session and for sharing a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Um, it is clear that you are so passionate. I really love what you said about how it's really our responsibility to share untold stories. And that's definitely something that I'm gonna be taking with me um, and thinking about even after this session. So thank you so much again for being here. Um, and thank you to our audience. Before we wrap up, we just wanted to share a few ways that you can stay connected with us throughout the coming months. So if you have questions about admissions or your application, you can email us at admissions at nyu.edu. If you are specifically interested in NYU Abu Dhabi, you can reach us at nyuad at admissions.nyu.edu. And if you are interested in NYU Shanghai, you can email us at shanghai.admissions at nyu.edu. And also please be sure to check out our other offerings by visiting this link that we are going to drop in the chat. Um, and then finally, our next Trailblazer session is one week from today on Wednesday, December 8th. So we hope to see you there. And again, thank you so much, Professor Bishop. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And we look forward to welcoming you to our campus soon. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye now. Okay. Wait a second.